Thank you, Eric. I think we're going to open up the floor right now for questions before we turn to the panel. And I'd like to ask the first question. Um, so both uh, Vicki and Carolyn talked about having data standards that it depends a lot on the question that is going to be asked for the, the value of data standards. So most of what we've been talking about with sharing clinical data is a lot of secondary and tertiary analysis of, of uh, clinical data. So the people that are doing the secondary and the tertiary analysis may not have the same question in mind that the primary uh, clinical trial was designed for. And in fact, most of the, the trials that NIH funds and would like to get as much use of as possible would be for questions that have not yet been developed to be asked. So wouldn't that say that you might want to put data standards in at the beginning for all the clinical trials? I mean, I, look, I think there are a couple things that we're talking about here when we talk about standards. Clearly, I think one of the things that, that Carolyn talked about that's important is defining disease and what I would call having a clear understanding of clinical phenotypes and how we're characterizing them. And there's a huge need to do that to really develop a, a, a taxonomy of disease that's clear so that we can understand what we're talking about and who we're talking about and which subsets we're talking about. And as we moved in targeted therapies and as we get into the human genome, this is going to become even more important because we know not every type 2 diabetes patient is the same, yet we all call them that. So yes, to me that is a, a standard, but it is not about a data standard, it's about a definition. And it's about having clarity of understanding what it is we're talking about and who it is we're talking about. Whether you sit down to say, okay, we're going to drive that by taking case report forms and making everybody talk about a patient the same way in a case report form field, or whether you do that to bring clarity to the practice of medicine and disease definition, I'm not sure I care, but I actually think the end game here is about clarity of patient populations and who we're talking about. And so, I think that's what your project demonstrated, was you have a lot of different characteristics to define different types of cogn cognition in Alzheimer's, and getting a handle on that is very helpful, not just for that particular case report form or that particular clinical trial or that particular regulatory finding, but quite frankly, for the field. So to me, that's an important end game. I'm also not saying that we don't need formats and we don't need standards. I'm just saying let's be thoughtful about the fact that when we do these standards, they aren't solving as many problems as we all might hope. They aren't solving the quality problem. They aren't solving the definition problem. They aren't solving the knowledge problem. And they certainly aren't solving the analytics problem. So, you know, it, it makes it easier. It's good to have. But I look at five years in 50 therapeutic areas and lack of clarity of disease definition, and I go, okay, wh where are we going to wind up? And where should we be spending our efforts? And how much do we spend, again, depending on the question, to get absolutely 100% pristine data, which we never get, sort of what's the sweet spot to answer the question, even in a primary analysis? And Eric likes to talk about this, what data is good enough and how much do we need. And I think we all strive for 100 percent clean, but we aren't going to get there. So, you know, it, it's, it's to me, it's about, again, striking the right balance. It's not to say no standards or all standards. It's, it's how do we make sense? And part of that is going to be about questions. So let's take review. There are certain questions, for example, in farm talks that when you talk to farm talks reviewers, they ask and they will want to look at it, and they will pretty much want to look at it every single time. That's a great place to do standardization. But if you're looking at type 1 diabetes and, ca and trying to characterize pancreatic function that's left, we've been debating area under the curve for C-peptide for 10 years. I'm not sure that's the place to make a decision to say, you've got to collect it every time with a four-hour fasting, and we're going to take the area under the curve. I don't think we're clear on that. So, you know, that's, that's what I'm getting at. How do we do this in a more informed way and integrate disease definition and clarity and taxonomy, which is where I really think much of the work needs to be done? I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, there's a point of clarification. I don't want to. 
Are you saying that you think the, the direction we're going of 55 and 5 is not a good investment of resource? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that when we look at the effort that we put in and we, we did the experiment and we standardized the data, it didn't fix everything magically. Okay, okay so I just want to make sure we set our expectations at the right place. And if I could, it matters on how much we're spending on it. Yeah, and it matters on time and money. I mean, you know. Carol. I have a question for Eric. Carol Nomura from UC Berkeley. And you mentioned open architectures and many decades of in licensing into open standards repositories have actually resulted in many that conflict with one another yeah. or just don't achieve the goal of yeah. ha having been deposited, then everyone can use it. So what do you recommend that we proactively do going forward to avoid some so of these conflicts up front? It's a great question. You know, one of the thing, one of the ways I, I think about that and using, you know, what happened in semiconductors, some of these other things as, as, as an analogy as well is that I actually don't believe in aggregating things until you really have a good handle of what you want to ask it. Um, so, so technologically, for example, I'm actually not a big fan of data warehouses. I'd rather do very light, agile, hypothesis-specific marts. And I know that just sounds like IT speak, but what I'm really saying is aggregate the source around the question quickly and effectively. So what you're not doing is you're not building a lot of bank, a lot of detail, a lot of things in it. You may grab a different technology the next time you go. The standards will have moved. You know, so you're not you're not maintaining a lot of the the history into these things. And again, I, I think that one of the things I try to do because there are a lot of conflicting things out there. There's actually a lot of great commercial offerings as well, right? A lot of folks have done uh, John Quackenbush at Dana Farber has done great stuff. You know, on, on the commercial side with with some of the things um, based on I, I guess like Salvers owns the products now. But what I had done at the time was just like you know NIH had just compiled this great stuff. It was available. The public had paid for it. What if an industry group took it and proved it and gave it back. I just thought that was a good experiment to run on the technology side um, as well. Why are you not a fan of big data warehouses? What's wrong with that if we do it correctly? I'm not, I'm not against it. Again, I mattered on the question. If you have a historic, so for example, if we were starting now with agile marts in oncology and we were doing them, say you're talking about solid tumors or liquid tumors or all the different ways you could think about oncology, right? If you were doing that over time and growing it, as an asset, like at FDA, if we were able to do that and take every, do that over time in every pre-market cancer, fog, that's probably a very worthwhile thing to do. But if it's going to get to a, a set of cost, you know, the minute you put, you know, so say you design it because you have 50 questions. When you've answered the 50th question, it is instantly an expense. And what we see is a lot of places can't carry that expense long time or people lose interest in it. And we're doing the next, j and is doing the next Transmart for just that reason. It worked well, but it worked to a point and go. So I, I, I tend to think of, if you think of that life cycle through it, it's okay. Don't lose the data though, you, you can migrate it. So I, I think it's just, if I, was, if I was a company building my IP, I would be more warehouse driven. If I'm at Cedar looking at things, I'd probably be therapeutically driven, but I wouldn't want to get too focused. I mean, I'll go back to what both Carolyn and Vicki said about cancer and, and disease definition. I think cancer is one of those places where we know there's gonna be a lot of movement in how we're defining the disease. I have a comment and then a, a question. I didn't realize that uh, Transmart was initially started at, with the UBiopred project, and uh, it made me reflect on one of my first meetings at IMI where I, we were talking to them about what their needs are, and the person designing the case report forms for the trial that they were starting with UBiopred didn't realize that C dash was available. And he said, if I had known about C dash, I could have done my case report forms much faster. I could have started my trial two months earlier. And that was, um, you know, developed because of some of the innovation that Jana Woodcock was promoting in terms of yeah. letting, uh, de developing standards around a core data set and a set that's required across all trials. Sure. And I think this is really valuable to point out, Absolutely. like you said, where's the sweet spot? Because um, that allows investigators who do trials to get the same questions from each company, and they don't have to meet I, all the different needs of every single person who puts together a trial. And so CDASH, to me, I keep trying to promote the use of it up front because you always lose mm. the integrity when you map at the back end and it's costly and the value is obviously up front. So when you talk about all the therapeutic areas which are to augment C-dash, I'd like to go back to Frank's question and 
what value do you see in that and where should you do you think we should be going well i think i mean from my end first of all i think you you raise a great example because again just like i said on the process side when you're going for process efficiency i want my case report forms to be consistent across all these clinical sites i'm I'm fully with you that doing it all up front makes complete sense now transborn actually was several years before um i am i but it was in j and j so it was the first time it came out of j and j uh, across therapeutic areas. So I, I actually have, have no disagreement. I, I agree with you on the front side. Um, so I, I do the Henry Ford thing because I'm often looking at this and my, my favorite quote from him is, if I only listen to my customers, I'd be building faster horses. And I think, you know, we've got to, we've got to kind of think um, a, a little bit towards this and saying that you want to both lead folks to your point, people that are designing clinicals, make sure they've got good tools in their hands so they are making their job easier up front, you know, and, and doing things like that. So on, on the Efficacy and efficiency side, it's fine. If we're talking about pooling clinical trials data down the road for secondary, tertiary, and other use, I get a little fuzzier. Meaning that I, you know, I, I'm. I was listening to questions. The last question, the gentleman, I think, who said, if you, you know, you get eighty percent of the value for twenty percent of the effort for that data use, I'm with them. Mm-hmm. So, can you uh, somebody answer the question about where do you think you know this whole thing with Padufa and the fifty-eight and five or whatever? How far do you think that can go in terms of bringing value? And where, what would you advise for people who are trying to develop the standards in that area? Well, I think, I think you have to figure out in the experiment where the asymptote is, is that's all, right? Where does more cost not equal more benefit? So that's why I fully, I actually think it's com- a complete benefit to do it at the right cost, because that's what value is about. It's, it's what you get out and, you know, the government spends a lot of money. I'm very, I'm very cognizant. I want to make sure they're spending for the right reason, right? Um, so I, I just think it's, it's really at a point which, where, where Vicky said, what are the major fields? What parts of the review process are actually getting automated? We're looking at talks. We're looking at these things. You know, we can look at you and tell you what's going in and where it's not. We can tell you, like Vicky said, where they print it out, they put it on the wall, and data mining means they stand closer to the wall when they look at it, literally. So I think, I think it's looking at the different types of data coming in, and, I, and I, so I'm fully supportive of it. It's just a matter of it's not going to make it perfect, so don't get too far to the right on the asymptote as far as spending goes. That's all I'm saying. Well, and just to be real clear, what CDISC is doing isn't funded by FDA, just so everybody else in the room knows, because that uh, it's important to us how we spend our money. It, right, absolutely. Well. Right, it is time though, and I and I it is a lot of time, and it's a lot of reviewers' time, and I'm not again not suggesting that we shouldn't do it. I just I think what Eric and I are trying to articulate is it solves a certain set of problems for process, and there are certain parts of review that are going to be very processed. But if we look forward, for example, in oncology again, where this is going, even from a review standpoint, ideally, if you're looking at a next-in-class product or you're looking at the same mechanism of action in a different indication, which is what we're going to see in oncology because these will be mechanism-based therapies, we would like to be able to look across other trials. And I'm not sure that this is going to solve all of those problems because we'll need flexible, agile tools. We'll need subject matter experts. And, and, and so I think what we're saying is, yes, it's important effort, and obviously it's going to happen, but let's set our expectations at the right place and let's set our time and energy spent on that and, and make sure we put some equal thought into the analytics side into the flexibility side because we get to the point and we saw this in the legacy data conversion where we constrain ourselves by the standard and by the data model and then what you wind up with is a whole bunch of columns of data that don't fit anywhere and that's one of the problems with the warehouse model then you've got them all in these like other and it's important information because as i said some of that other data was actually phenotypic data, racial identification data. So, you know, it's just making sure we're smart about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, but, but on this same theme of what's process and what makes reviews down the road more efficient, uh, put in the context of some of the real life examples that we've heard about where late, rather late in the day of classes of drugs, a signal emerges. I think 
one of the you well, someone has already referred to the so-called suicidality signal, and that created a lot of work and uh, with the FDA, as you know. Uh, and even to this day, and, and I, I attended the advisory group in which the class labeling for suicidality for anti-epileptics was discussed. And it struck me, I, I, I was really puzzled because the criteria that were applied statistically made it impossible to answer the question whether or not there was equivalent risk across drugs. I won't go into the details. Uh, retrospectively, then, what does one put in place so that this kind of cumulative databases that academia, the FDA, and everyone is gathering allows us to intelligently interrogate across multiple classes of drugs and make intelligent decisions? And at a simple, at a very simple level, I thought the idea of standardization was is at least those terms of risk and all, the adverse events or possible other things that were recorded, would be recorded more or less in the same way, recognizing the quality of data that would not be universally there. So I, it was a fairly simple notion. And, uh, you know, and I, I heard and I understood this 55, 50, whatever you're calling it now, as in that spirit of getting us together, and I noticed schizophrenia was the one, one so I'm a little familiar with that, to, because it's a very complex illness in which how we record symptoms and how we I hate to use the word standardize that record, is abysmal, right, about to be perfectly honest. And how could that not be a potentially positive thing for the long run to put a little more effort in there? Are we really wasting our money to do that to get back to the question? Is, is, are, you, are, you, are you really saying that no, that's No, I'm not effort? saying we're wasting our money. I'm saying that this is beyond the FDA. Clearly, because it goes back to your exact point, in my, this is my opinion, that we need disease definition, we need d disease taxonomy, and I really think that the NIH needs to be engaged in this effort. Clinicians need to be, we had an extensive discussion at the last IOM meeting in neuroscience about just this topic and that the incredible need for this. I don't see that as CDISC's problem. I really don't. I see that as a bigger issue for the medical community. So to the extent that CDISC can help drive or solve that problem, great. But I don't think that that is the FDA's, I don't think that that issue is solved by standardizing case report form fields. Yeah, that's, were, that's what I'm saying. And actually, I, I fully agree with you. I'm glad they didn't wait for more standards to do that study. Right. You know, so I, I think that's what, I mean, you, you know, you go with what you see and where, the, where you are with the data, but having better stuff to look, be, make it easier next time, of course it makes